Hey guys, how's it going? Just woke up not long ago and I'm actually drinking some coffee here. And uh, it's 5.55 a.m. And I want to do some more run-throughs. And I want to go through Colossians because I see that it has four chapters just like Philippians. And, you know, I just need to get into the mode of recording and reading through the scriptures. So I'm going to just see if I can give any insight to this and um, go over it. And um, also just find out, you know, what I'm curious about, what I'm unsure of. But anyways, let's start with chapter 1. We have a greeting again at the beginning, the first two verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And Timotheus, our brother to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that, uh, you know, he seems to mention God our Father and then the Lord Jesus Christ together a lot. We see the two distinct persons. He says he's the apostle by the will of God. Um, so, you know, it's not just his own... Uh, you know, of his own power, or whatever. Um, but he's sent by God, and uh, so let's continue on to the thanksgiving and prayer, is what they have it categorized here in the e sword, from verses 3 to 14. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, again, God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there, we, you know, we really see two, two distinct persons there. Um, and so how people can say that Jesus is the Father is just absolutely absurd. You know, you can't be your own Father. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he says God, he means God the Father, um, specifically, and it's not denying that Jesus is God. Um. Uh, and so, you know, people can say that, they can say, look, see, the Father is God, but it doesn't say that Jesus is God. Well, it's not denying that Jesus is God, okay? Um, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which you have to all saints, uh, those are things that, you know, Paul would be happy to hear about, that, you know, they, they're keeping their faith in Jesus, and they have the love for all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. The hope, the heavenly hope, the, the hope of salvation, being with the Lord, which is a hope that is certain. You know, it's not, you know, well, I hope this happens. It might happen. It could happen. That's not what the hope means when we're talking about salvation. It's a guarantee. It's just that, you know, it's it's not come to fully realize yet. Um, you know, it's what's yet to come. Yet we have already obtained it, but uh, not fully, so to speak, I guess. Right? Uh, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, speaking of the gospel and bringing forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it and knew of the grace and truth grace of God and truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our fellow, our dear fellow servant, <laughs> what was that in Philippians, yoke fellow, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Might be filled with the knowledge of his will and the wisdom and, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So that's something that he's praying for them. So we can pray, you know, for ourselves or for others that to have, you know, the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Uh, fruitful in every good work, walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Walk 
walking continually in our own Christian walk, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto God the Father, or giving thanks unto the Father, sorry, it doesn't say God there, but giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. The saints in light. It's just kind of like the saints in Christ, I guess. You know, the we are the light of the world. Uh, who have delivered us from the power of darkness, and who hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Amen. And so, you know, if the Father is God, and that's his nature, is that he's deity, then of course his Son is. We're not sons of God in the same sense that Jesus is. <clears throat> So the preeminence of Christ, and I know this is kind of a controversial one, I guess, that we're getting into. I've talked about it before. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? So, um, <clears throat> you know, people will use this verse to say that, see, Jesus was born. You know, he's the firstborn of every creature, so he was created, so therefore he isn't God which would have to deny so many other scriptures and twist everything towards what they do. You know, we, we have to go, we have to, uh, you know, balance scripture with scripture and uh, everything has to work out right. And we see all over that Jesus is God. He wasn't created. And so him being the firstborn um, is not in that sense. Uh, what they say it is you know and a lot of people say that it, it means the preeminence of Christ um, just like this says this title here says verse 15 through 23 the preeminence of Christ I don't want to go into a whole lot about this I have before and it's something that I want to look into more again and I know there's like a couple different views and I don't remember you know what I've said before but I just want to continue through this, reading this passage to see what else we got here. So, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. The Lord Jesus. So we're talking about, we go back to verse 13 and it says, you know, At the beginning of verse 13, it's talking about the Father who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. And then it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So we know he's talking about his Son. And then it says, who is the, invisible, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. We're still talking about Jesus. And then for by him were all things created. Okay. So he must be deity. That doesn't mean, that means that he himself was not created. Because everything was created by him and for him. In verse 16. So that verse just screams the deity of Christ. But still, people deny it and say no. It teaches that he isn't God. How is that possible? Verse 17 says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And so, you know, there we see the scripture speaking specifically of preeminence. Um, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And you know, me going over these run-throughs and these... Uh, chapters and these epistles i'm planning on going back through and then doing like a full expository study like i did for first corinthians chapter two so i'm just kind of going through these remembering what's in them and stuff and then you know i'll go through them and then go look at commentaries and stuff and get a better more detailed study going on and you know hopefully 
it won't take too long to do that. Um, I think that I could get through these rather quickly if I stick on it, but uh, that's my plans as well. Verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto him, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your your mind by wicked works, yet hath now yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. That's one of those verses that people could use that they would say, so you can lose your salvation, because it says, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled. So it's saying you can be saved, and you can believe in Christ one day, and the next day you don't believe in Christ, and then you lose your salvation. Um, but I think that really he's saying here that only, you know, the true believers would continue in the faith, um, and the ones who apostatize or leave the faith were never really believed believers to begin with. Um, you know, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and so, you know, if they didn't continue, they weren't grounded or settled. Um, and we kind of see that with, uh, you know, the parable of the sower, you know, and the one that, you know, didn't have any root. Um, so there's a lot more that could be looked at in detail there, but I'm just going to keep going. Paul's ministry to the church. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, and there's that word dispensation, where dispensationalists will say, see, it's in the Bible. And, you know, that's something that I was thinking about while I was up last night, that I'd like to go over more dispensations. And I saw that recently Max Bauer and Robert Breaker had this live study where they're talking about dispensations or whatever. And uh, I just feel like I need to go over that stuff more, um, that I'm not a dispensationalist anymore, and try to explain all this stuff. But I might put up a video pretty soon, just kind of briefly going over some things to try to help explain until I do some more detailed things. But anyways, um, even the mystery which hath been hidden from the ages, from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. The mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. And so, uh, that's kind of like, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it mentions the mystery um, being preached. And it mentions, uh, there's a verse that says, um, <laughs> I could go there, but you know, he says, the one where he says, you know, no, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, basically, uh, you know, the glory that the, the, the Lord has prepared for us. And I said, you know, that's not speaking of heaven or the future. It's that he basically, what he meant was, you know, um, that it was, it was hidden before, but you know what, it was what he, uh, you know, prepared for them to have then basically, you know, the mystery that had been hid from ages and generations is now made manifest. So, um, yeah, I can't remember how I went over that, but that would have been a good cross-reference, I think, for that. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
and we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his work, which worketh in me mightily. There's the word perfect again that, you know, a lot of people seem to get hung up on and give different meanings to. So that's an interesting uh, <clears throat> chapter. Again, it seems like, you know, he's not rebuking them so far. Um, it's a pretty good one, a good report, like, to the Philippians, uh, saying, you know, they've done well and rejoice in sufferings. So we got the preeminence of Christ. This is very, very important for, you know, the person of Christ. That's a very important section of scripture there. Um, but there's a lot that's good in all this. So I'm going to end this and go on to the next chapter. God bless.